Welcome to 1970s America, the height of the Cold War. This is Melinda Cole Klein. Between 1965 and 1980, America changed with the efforts of the Vietnam War, struggles in the Middle East, and the civil rights movement here at home. With the inability to ensure an independent South Vietnam, fear of the spread of communism took on a real and applied result. And the 1970s would reduce American confidence in the federal government. This decade was riddled with economic problems, social division, all the while the Cold War continued even after America pulled out of Vietnam. This decade would see President Richard Nixon facing impeachment charges to which the President resigned after the Watergate scandal and cover-up. Meanwhile, as Americans continued to purchase automobiles, their lives were impacted on a day-to-day -day basis because of the lack of gasoline by the middle of the decade. The Vietnam War, a major Cold War conflict, hallmarked during a nuclear arms race, begun because of ideological differences between communism and democracy. In the early 1960s, President John F. Kennedy, under advice, decided to support the efforts of South Vietnam, a non-communist country against the corruption within the country and from the communist north. It was believed that communism in newly independent countries would spread throughout Southeast Asia and this spread the fear of world war. During the Cold War, Western powers argued that the spread of communism had to be stopped. There are two principles that support this. First, communism is incompatible with free market capitalism. The economic struggles of the 1970s historically were unique. By 1974, America had entered its worst economic turndown since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Unemployment was high and real wages declined. When U.S. involvement in the war ended in 1973, with the treaty between North and South Vietnam, the government had a ballooning deficit because of fighting the war. This combined with printing more money caused inflation. Once returning veterans began seeking jobs, combined with the end of government manufacturing contracts, this feature of the American economy created layoffs and higher unemployment. Another problem in the U.S. economy was that of rising energy costs. Scholars have estimated that at the time the U.S. population consumed 40 percent of the world's energy resources but was only 6 percent of the global population. Because the United States continued down a path of reliance on foreign sources of petroleum products, this left America vulnerable to shortages and this is what happened. With rising unemployment combined with prices of commodities continuing to rise, the solutions by the Office of the President and Congress only seemed to make inflation worse and not better. The federal deficit continued to rise as the government attempted to manipulate economic factors. One of the main problems in regards to unemployment was the decline in manufacturing jobs an issue Americans deal with today. In particular, the three largest motor companies who sold collectively about 90% of their vehicles within the United States 
were hit hard because of the significant drop in sales and high gasoline prices. In addition, fuel-efficient Japanese imports, especially Honda, offered Americans an alternative. Historically, the United States produced nearly half of the steel sold globally. By the late 1970s, this facet of American manufacturing dwindled to less than 20 percent. Much of the world's steel was now produced more efficiently, thus at a lower cost by Japanese companies. At the end of World War II, the British and French divided up former remains of the Ottoman Empire to create the nations of Syria, Lebanon, and other Arab countries with Egypt, Jordan, and Iraq. While the British especially kept close tabs on its former colonies and new independent areas, emerging Arab politics and the fight for the control over the new state of Israel brought increased tensions. As the United States came into the 1970s, they had a new concern, obtaining oil for industry and personal use vehicles as Americans owned millions of automobiles. To protect their interests and to get better prices for selling their oil reserves, oil producing exporting countries formed OPEC. However, members of this oil exporting organization heightened the political climate. On October 6, 1973, the combined forces of Egypt and Syria had attacked Israel. The Arab oil producing countries voted to embargo oil shipments to Europe and to the U.S. The impact was worldwide. Rationing took place across the United States as resources became low. This resulted in driving up the price of oil and gasoline at the pump for the average person, while gas stations kept short hours and often ran out of gas. I distinctly remember gasoline selling for 25 cents a gallon. This price, of course, would go up a little bit in the 1970s to close to a dollar a gallon, which at the time was just outrageous. In 1974, I waited in line from 5 a.m., as shown in this image here, for my turn at the gas station when they opened up. Around the corner, right behind about 20 or so other cars. In California, it was not possible to get gasoline unless it was your day to do so. Days were odd and even, depending on your license plate. So if the day was the 24th of the month and your license plate ended in an even number, you could buy gasoline. Sometimes you were assigned days such as Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays for cars with even number license plates. Odd numbers were the rest of the week. Oftentimes gasoline stations closed, as I mentioned, when they ran out. Sometimes this was by 10 a.m. in the morning. This run on gasoline made Arabian oil politics very personal for U.S. commuters in the 1970s, a time that we have not forgotten. Only about 10 percent of America's youth became involved in the anti-establishment hippie movement which glorified the rejection of political, social, and cultural normality and traditions. Instead of trying to reform politics and society, as previous generations have done, by taking to the polls and voting, along with creating community-based awareness, the youth counterculture rejected established Western traditions. Drugs and sex intertwined with music, 
that sent messages about free love and condemning traditional institutions such as work, family, and self-sacrifice. Understandably, average mom and pops were horrified with the rejections of family traditions and sexual morality in favor of a life of no rules or consequences. As this generation learned, life always has consequences. It would be the musical lyrics, performer body language, and influence of African-American rhythm and blues, sounds, and beats that would attract a youthful population to rebel against established Western culture. Politically driven, a vocal minority of youths argued to leave Vietnam. Three American subculture groups became media attention seekers demanding recognition for their individuality. Number one, hippies. Number two, the new left. These are extreme liberals promoting gay rights, abortion, and non-traditional lifestyles. Number three, the civil rights movement, including the militant Black Panthers. While the drive for individualism was fueled by the new left, resistance to the mixing of American society continued in many southern states. This often led to violent confrontations between the politically dominant whites and blacks seeking equality. The new left argued for the unimaginable such as redistribution of corporate profits and more social equity regardless of race or sexual ideals. Meanwhile, the number of poor grew along with those becoming reliant on welfare and food stamps. For them, the voice of the new left promised a better tomorrow. All the while, the Democratic Party was in transition. For those staunch supporters of the status quo, they left the party to remain true to their conservative values. The Democratic Party during the 1960s and 1970s began to attract segments of society such as the poor and marginal, promising them change. The political and social climate of the late 1970s included anti-war movements. Students in New York, Boston, and Washington, D.C. demanded all removal of U.S. troops from Vietnam. By the spring of 1970, President Nixon announced the withdrawal of 150,000 combat troops over the coming year. While this was good, President Nixon told the nation that U.S. troops just invaded Cambodia to disrupt enemy supply lines that ran through that country along the so-called Ho Chi Minh Trail. The idea of expanding the war under any circumstances brought protesters back into the streets. American students reacted. In May 1970, at Kent State University in Ohio, thousands of college students rampaged through the business district off campus. This led to a confrontation with riot police who were trying to protect private property. But the students ran away back to campus. The same evening, they took control of the campus's ROTC building and torched it to protest the war. Hundreds of thousands of middle-class, law-abiding parents understood their children as university students could potentially be swayed by and through peer pressure to commit lawless abandon. Unruly students paralleled the unruly efforts by hippie anti-establishment members. 
parents teachers and police noticed a changing student population in the one nine hundred sixty s while a minor population across the nation these outspoken violent students could cause much damage to private property on may fourth nine hundred seventy the college called the governor for help in turn the national guard supported local police to quell the student unrest on campus forces confronted an angry anti-government student congregation numbering about five hundred while students hurled bottles and rocks at the guardsmen they tried to break up the swell of students by throwing tear gas into the crowd suddenly without warning a group of guardsmen fired their rifles into the crowd of students killing four and wounding nine others word of this event touched off campus protests nationwide and sixteen more states had to call in national guard units to control crowds on university campuses the government supported the efforts of state authorities to control student unrest which were seen as unpatriotic violent and a threat to the nation's health and public safety while the steel plants and smaller car companies closed more and more manufactured imports were making their way into American stores. But as American companies diversified in a variety of products or moved their companies to the South where wages were cheaper, other American entrepreneurs created new devices. After World War II, the U.S. economy had slowly declined in its manufacturing capacity. The U.S. economy had since its founding offered services to its citizens and the world. This feature of the economy included banks, investment companies, the stock exchange, health care, insurance, and universities. However, this economic facet began to dominate the national economy at the same time while manufacturing jobs dropped to less than 20 percent by the 1970s as compared to 30 percent in the 1950s. But this manufacturing picture was not completely without life. In America we continued to build airplanes, spacecraft and satellites, home and office machinery, and in time computers. Thus high-tech companies began to develop in the United States. Like Henry Ford who began in a garage, Steve Jobs and Stephen Wozniak started out very small as they built the first computer in a parent's garage. In time this partnership turned into Apple Computers. By the mid-1970s, claims that this computing device would change people's lives was not taken seriously, but it did. Then Bill Gates and Paul Allen created Microsoft in 1975, to which the company would specialize in the manufacture of computer software. Both Apple and IBM, founded in 1911, were competing for a share of the market. Time-saving smart technologies sell. Today, IBM boasts the largest non-government employer with close to half a million Americans working at IBM. According to its history, once Bill Gates of Microsoft signed a contract with IBM, he became a multi-millionaire seemingly overnight. In the election of 1968, this event would bring Richard Milhouse Nixon into the office of the presidency, 
a fiscal conservative, Nixon appealed to middle-of-the-road Republicans and urban Democrats. By cutting social welfare programs, but not Social Security, the President appeased those who had voted him into office. And with the retirement of Earl Warren from the Supreme Court, Nixon appointed Warren Burger, as he believed that this justice would stick to a strict interpretation of the U.S. Constitution. President Nixon would win re-election in 1972, a landslide victory against George McGovern. Unfortunately, while President Nixon would receive much controversy over his actions regarding Vietnam, the President would break the law. This 1972 event, remembered as the Watergate scandal, would end the political career of Richard Nixon. A plan that included White House staff called for disguised burglars to wiretap the phones at the Democratic National Committee offices. After the burglars were arrested, it was leaked during the trial of 1973 that they had accepted a bribe to keep quiet about White House involvement. The cover-up unraveled. The President tried to use his powers to control the investigation. The liberal media had a field day with the President, labeling him as a crook and tyrant. By 1974, the President's phone tapes were finally released for review. This evidence shocked the nation as the President's plan heard over the tapes. To avoid impeachment, President Nixon resigned, bringing his Vice President Gerald Ford to the office as President. Gerald Ford had come to this new role as President with much political experience and a man whose modesty is memorable. After taking office, President Ford pardoned Nixon for any wrongdoing that he might have committed. Ford believed this act was the quickest way to put the Watergate scandal to rest. But the public did not take this well. This action smelled of a corrupt bargain that was likely struck before Ford became president. Americans quickly lost confidence in President Ford. As the 1976 presidential cycle swung into action, American confidence for the president was a low. During the primaries, the governor of California, Ronald Reagan, loomed in the limelight as a Republican contender. But it would be Ford that the party nominated to run as the presidential incumbent. Jimmy Carter, a peanut planter from Georgia, and his state's former governor became quickly the Democrats' choice. Jimmy Carter was relatively unknown as a figure at the time. A Democrat, Carter appealed to conservative Democrats who leaned Republican depending on the issues. An ardent Southern Baptist, Carter seemed honest compared to Ford as the memories were still fresh in the minds of many Americans regarding Watergate. Carter was able to get the urban black vote, the southern white vote, and the votes of union members. However, the election saw a low turnout of only 55 percent of registered voters. Carter narrowly won against the incumbent president. President Carter moved to heal the nation as well. He pardoned draft dodgers of the Vietnam War and sought to bring the fractured Democratic Party back together. Carter, in a move similar to John F. Kennedy, grew the size of the federal government by creating the Department of Education. 
it would be this president that would appoint more minorities to government jobs than any other president before. To help the American economy, Carter was able to convince Congress to deregulate certain industries, such as trucking, the airline industry, and also communication. While it does not seem to find its way into history books, under President Carter in 1979, a bill signed by this president would change the course of beer history and its consumption in America. This bill deregulated the brewing industry, allowing for a microbrew industry to grow. Thank you, President Carter, for our beloved craft beers that grew the national economy. This act of deregulation allowed thousands of new companies to brew and sell their beer. By 1977, there were 218 new microbreweries. Restriction had been a leftover feature of prohibition aimed at curbing home alcohol production. This allowed, as far as the deregulation, the microbrew industry to take off during the 1980s. Today there are over 1,400 microbreweries that produce over 6 million barrels of beer, while achieving over $3 billion of the over $50 billion of American products produced for sale domestically. It goes without saying the microbrew industry in America maintains a noticeable feature of the economy. The late 1970s were filled with heated issues regarding foreign affairs, our relationship with communist Russia, and the dictatorships in Latin America. All the while, access to petroleum continued to be a glaring problem for the nation. So during the 1970s, the Cold War persisted for all three of these American presidents. One shining moment for Carter would be his diplomatic effort to smooth the tensions between Israel and Egypt. This took place in 1978. After persistent negotiations, Carter was proud to have settled Israel's right to exist by Egypt as an Arab nation. Israel agreed to return the Sinai Peninsula back to Egypt. It seemed tensions in the Middle East were toning down. And for the United States, the government offered both sides military aid that continues until this day. After Brown versus the Board of Education spawned desegregation of public schools, America witnessed turbulent social restructuring from 1955 through the 1970s. After this Supreme Court decision in 1954, the court continued to strike down segregated practices tied to transportation and the use of public spaces by the mid-1960s with a number of court rulings. The court eliminated social restrictions such as the one on interracial marriage that had formerly been barred in many states in America. These new laws superseded state laws, as it was argued, under the right to privacy. Additionally, when arrested, the court changed arrest policies and how much suspected criminals could be questioned. The court brought in another decade in which America was becoming a desegregated society. With another stroke of the pen, the Supreme Court banned school prayer in public schools. This court ruling brought considerable controversy and debate. But in time, under the Catholic President Kennedy, the mood in Washington, D.C. supported religious practices as a private matter. 
By the 1970s, the mandates from the Supreme Court were resisted in many states across the Union. After all, the end to Reconstruction after the American Civil War ensured states' rights in the management of their own populations. One hundred years after this event that had divided the nation and resulted in war, the Supreme Court, an arm of the federal government, was telling states how their people would live within their boundaries. Thus, resistance persisted to Supreme Court rulings, especially those that had consequential effects. Riots and protests resulted while the media covered events. One of the failures that proved to be taxing, not only on city government, but on teachers, children, and parents, was forced busing. Large school districts bused white and black children far out of their neighborhoods to other schools in which a racial balance could offer a desegregated experience. Because of a Supreme Court ruling following the 1976 Boston anti-busing riot, independent city districts did not have to participate in busting. Thankfully, I grew up in Downey, California from the age of nine. Our school district did not have to bus its students as our district was limited to our city. But I remember the outrage over the busing practices by the Los Angeles School District during the 1970s. Parents living in expensive Los Angeles County suburbs were outraged when their white children were bused to poor neighborhoods to learn in classrooms with black, Latino, and Asian children. Busing policies of desegregation hastened the trend for white families to relocate to school districts in suburbs that had independent schools and their districts respectively. This would contribute to the declining quality of inner city schools as these public institutions are supported through tax dollars. As property values plummeted in the inner cities, these schools suffered. During the 1970s, the Republican Party gained new members. Liberal decisions such as forced busing encouraged Southern Democrats and working class sectors to join the new conservative movement that had been gaining momentum. Some historians have called this surge the new right. Those looking for manufacturing jobs sought the leadership from Republicans. All the while, affirmative action reserved jobs not for those best qualified, but for minorities, and taxes were increasing as well at this time. It seemed the world was turned upside down. The silent majority objected to liberal policies that forced social change. Many believed change should be done voluntarily and states should have the right to manage their own populations. In the election of 1980, President Jimmy Carter ran against Ronald Reagan, governor of California. Reagan focused on the nation's crippling economic problems. His warmth, humor, and charisma convinced Americans that the country could be reset on the right track. The election was a landslide victory for Republicans, bringing this charming and intelligent politician to the White House with the election of 1980. Both Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan left an indelible mark on the history of America, each in their own ways. During the Cold War, their challenges were many. However, the 1980 election would bring new leadership to the White House after the liberal agenda of the Supreme Court and the scandal of Watergate. 
By 1980, America had moved far enough away from the Vietnam War and Watergate to begin a new decade. The election of Ronald Reagan would set America on the right course. Surprisingly, a turn of events between Reagan and the new Russian President Gorbachev would lead to military disarmament between the United States and a post-Cold War Russia by the late 1980s. And the wall between East and West Germany, the Berlin Wall, would literally end the Cold War.